If you are not a regular consumer of conservative media in this country, if you aren't watching uh, the Fox News Channel or listening to right-wing talk radio or reading right-wing blogs all day, we are in a moment in American politics in which there are things happening, things being proposed and enacted by elected officials that may seem really out of the blue to you. Uh, that may seem like non sequiturs, that may seem like they don't bear any relationship to the actual news in our actual country, the actual changes, uh, challenges that we actually face. But nevertheless, these things are being acted on with great urgency by conservative politicians. For example, uh, the state of Oklahoma voting to ban Sharia law. Actually, 13 states moving to ban Sharia law. Is there any threat of Sharia law taking over in any American state? No, not in any rational assessment of fact. But it has become a matter of great urgency for conservatives in all these places. It's the same dynamic we saw with supposed death panels in health reform, right? If you consumed fact-based information about health reform, you know that the thing the right turned into death panels was about having a living will. Absolutely nothing to do with some board of bureaucrats deciding you should die. But conservatives, informed not by fact-based information, but instead by conservative media, not only believed in death panels, but believed that death panels were the main defining thrust of what health reform was. This is conceptually important in our country in 2011. If you do not like watching conservative media, you nevertheless have to understand what it is they're doing over there in order to understand what Republicans are doing in politics. It's like the secret decoder ring that makes otherwise totally non sequitur statements and political actions make some sense, at least make us understand what sense they think they're making. To that end, uh, we have a slight revision to make. It is not a correction, it is a revision to our lead story on yesterday's show. Uh, it finally occurred to us today that we had not applied right-wing media decoder technology to what's going on right now with Speaker of the House, the top Republican in Washington, John Boehner, in trying to understand his latest big political mistake. As you know, John Boehner is not having an easy time as Speaker. Republicans are having a hard time getting even basic legislating done, having a hard time doing the basic things that need to be done uh, to run the House, having a hard time uh, picking a message and sticking with it, getting their members to act as a unit and instead of like a bunch of six-year-olds playing anarchist soccer, three teams, two goals, you decide. Uh, but even with the hard time they are having, what John Boehner did this week is so bad politically, so contrary to what his party says it wants to be doing, that it has to have some explanation. It's like if somebody was trying to parallel park and instead of, oh, hey, wait a minute, you sort of messed up, your tire's up on the curb here. This is a guy who was parallel parking and all of a sudden the car is upside down. Something else has to explain this. You do not just make an error this big without something explaining it. Over the last two years since President Obama has taken office, the federal government has added 200,000 new federal jobs. Uh, and uh, and it, if uh, some of those jobs are lost in this, so be it. We're broke. It's time for us to get serious about how we're spending uh, the nation's money. Do you have an estimate on how many will, and won't that impact negatively impact the economy? I do not. I do not. Why would I even care? Why bother counting? How people are going to lose their jobs? What do I care? That's going to have a bad effect on the economy? Pfft to the woman standing behind him going, that's right, John. How can you be the top Republican in Washington and say you don't care if what you're doing is killing jobs? The unemployment rate is like 9%. We'd be delighted to make it worse. Our actions will put more people, more Americans out of work in this economy. Awesome, we're all for it. Come on, I mean, you don't accidentally let something like that slip. Where is he coming from? What is he talking about? The federal government has added 200,000 new federal jobs. Uh, and uh, it, if uh, some of those jobs are lost in this, so be it. A, that's not true. But B, I think we're getting at something here with the emphasis he's putting on federal jobs, federal jobs, public jobs. See, those are the jobs he's okay with killing. Those aren't real jobs. People who work for government don't have real jobs. Public jobs are bad jobs. Republicans are against those kinds of jobs. They want those jobs to go away. If you are not part of the conservative movement, if you're not in on the way they talk to each other in their media, this probably makes no sense. Republicans declaring that teachers 
cops, firefighters, toll takers, nurses, people who work at the highway department. If you're employed in any one of those jobs, your job is not a real job. In fact, you're having that job is bad for the country and the country would be better off if you were unemployed. Public employees are an enemy of America. And the only way America's gonna get stronger is if public employees are broken. That's the message. If you work taking tolls on a bridge somewhere, you are the problem. If you teach school, you are the problem. They have been talking amongst themselves this way in conservative media and conservative politics for a long time, but now it is crossing over. And if you just take it at face value, it seems like a big political mistake, but there's a whole lot of Republicans standing behind John Boehner going, that's right, we hate those jobs. It has become mainstream centrist Republican policy, a mainstream centrist Republican point, even in punditry, to congratulate any Republican politician who declares war on people who work in the public sector. Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, was in Washington today, essentially test driving a presidential run. The basis of his popularity among conservatives, among Republicans, is how hard a line he is taking against teachers and cops and anybody who works for any level of government. Chris Christie's office has created a YouTube channel that largely features clips of him confronting and yelling at people who are evil enough to work for the state. Or it's clips of him discussing ways he's going to take things that people who work in the public sector have negotiated for, how he's going to take those things away. One of the ways that Tim Pawlenty has tried to fuel his little engine that could presidential aspirations is by talking about people who work for the state as if they are murderous prisoners coming after you in the prison yard. I am not kidding. Frankly, said the Minnesota governor in November, quote, the public employee unions would stick a shiv in all of us if they could. A shiv? Those are the kind of things that Republican politicians say now if they're ambitious, if they want to make themselves more popular. That's how Scott Walker, the Republican governor of Wisconsin, is trying to make his national mark. On Friday, Governor Walker announced suddenly that he was refusing to negotiate with anybody who worked for the state. No negotiations. Instead, he would direct the Republican-controlled legislature to pass by fiat this week his new budget that goes after the benefits and bargaining rights of people who work for the state. So not only would he not negotiate with people on this, he will never negotiate with them again. He will remove their right to collectively bargain, in essence. While shocked by the radicalness of his proposal and by how fast he is trying to jam it through, state workers in Wisconsin prove that they are not going to take this lying down. Look at this. An estimated 30,000 people protested in the state capital of Madison today. 30,000 people. That's double the number of people who turned out yesterday in Madison. You know the protests we've been covering in Bahrain and all these places today? The turnout in Wisconsin's capital today seemed to equal the turnout in Bahrain's capital city. Everybody's wondering if that uprising is going to overthrow that government. We'll have more on that later in the show, but we've got 30,000 people, the same number of people, in Madison, Wisconsin. The AP describing the protest as larger and more sustained than any in Madison in decades. The floor of the rotunda in the State House was filled with sleeping bags last night because demonstrators would not go home. A public hearing to take public testimony on what the governor was trying to do in Wisconsin was in hour 17 when Republican lawmakers tried to end it. They decided they had heard enough. That was at 3 in the morning. Democrats kept the hearing going, taking a short break only at 8.30 a.m. so they could move to another room. And then they started the hearing right back up again. The state's second largest school district in Madison today had no school because teachers and staff called in sick and went to the state capitol to protest. Because of organizing by people who cash paychecks rather than sign paychecks, uh, because of organizing by employees, by people who work for the company, not the people who own the company, that's how we got laws against child labor in this country. That's how we got a minimum wage. That's how we got the 40-hour work week and weekends. You like those? Uh, that's why we have sick days. That's why there is such a thing as overtime. These things were all hard fought by the labor movement. Their insistence over generations that working full time in America should earn you a living, should get you out of poverty. That overtime is what created the American middle class. And you can't understand today's modern politics. The stuff seems like inexplicable mistakes by somebody like the Speaker of the House who ought to know better. You can't understand today's modern conservative politics without understanding that Republicans and the modern conservative movement are against the thing that made it possible for America to have a middle class. There is chaos all around, around the globe, pockets of instability.
It is caused by unions. Public employee unions are not going to be able to have the same ridiculous benefits that they have had in the past. Union teachers battling cuts. They say they're fighting for the kids, but are they really fighting to help themselves? Maybe it's time they get out of the train business uh, or and find something else like paying off some of our debt as a, as a solution here instead of their, their teacher union, labor union friends all the time. Unionizing the TSA, while potentially disastrous for the country, is going to be great for the unions. You see, you pay the screener, they pay the union. I wonder how much of that money will be spent in America and how much will be spent overseas organizing revolutions. Up next in our Union Watch, we give out our very first Follow the Money Giver Award to the governor of Wisconsin, who threatens to call out the National Guard if the unions revolt against his latest plan. If you do not consume this stuff uh, from right-wing media regularly, it may be a uh, surprise to hear it, but it is sort of the only way to understand uh, why the newest crop of ambitious Republican leaders are trying to advance themselves, advance their own careers by kicking teachers and, and toll takers and firefighters and cops, kicking them in the teeth whenever they have the opportunity. Wisconsin public employees are showing us that they are very capable of standing up for themselves. That's why we've seen these incredible scenes in Madison these last few days. But who is standing up for them? Who stands up for them? I mean, the right is unified against them. Do we want to go back to the era where there were no child labor laws, no weekends? Do we want to do that as a country? Who stands with them? Who stands with these folks when they are attacked like this? Uh, kids do, it turns out. This is footage of students from Memorial High, who along with students from East Madison High School and West High School and Middleton High School all took off from school today and went to the state capitol to support their teachers. Here are the firefighters of Wisconsin supporting the other public workers who are getting kicked in the teeth today in Wisconsin. Why is it important that these firefighters are out there? Because the only three unions that supported the Republican, Republican governor of Wisconsin in the last election were the firefighters and the cops and the state troopers, okay? Miraculously, those are the only three unions that Governor Scott, Scott Walker is not stripping of their rights. So even as this, this governor tries to divide and conquer different types of employees who work in the public sector, they are standing together. But what about the Democratic Party? Is the Democratic Party taking the other side of this? The Democratic Party just last month decided they are doing next year's Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, a city without union hotels. Democrats campaigned in 2008 saying they'd prioritize legislation, remember card check, uh, that would make it easier for people to join unions. Democrats have essentially dropped that off the agenda in Washington. If you go back to the Eisenhower era Republican Party, they were not against unions. From the Republican Party platform of 1956, quote, the protection of the right of workers to organize into unions and to bargain collectively is the firm and permanent policy of the Eisenhower administration. The Republican Party was not always hostile to people who work for a living. But over time, the conservative movement pushed the Republican Party into becoming really virulently anti-union. That's why Ronald Reagan breaking the air traffic controllers union was the shot heard round the world, because that was the roar of conservative movement politics becoming Republican politics. Since then, though, they've got the Republicans 100% on board, waging self-righteous war on unions, self-righteous war on the rights of people who cash paychecks instead of those who sign them. Where is the counterbalance to that? Where is the liberal movement in the United States that is pulling the Democrats to take the other side of this fight now that the conservatives are unified against working people in this way. Where is the liberal movement to take the other side of this and stand up for people who work for a living? When you look at these people in Wisconsin today, who's got their back? Russ Feingold was Wisconsin senator for 18 years. He has just formed a new progressive organization to try to change the imbalance of corporate power in American politics. He joins us next.